Well, hello, active traders, and welcome to our Trading Success Summit. Um, <laughs> a lot of the other speakers were probably uh, a bit busy, so uh, normally we have uh, six or seven people as um, as speakers, but this time uh, just four of us, so uh, we'll be able to stay kind of focused. Uh, can you guys do me a favor and somebody let me know? Uh, can you hear and see everything okay? I'm not going to broadcast my face. You don't need to see my face anyway, but can you see the charts on the screen okay? If you guys can let me know. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Wow, big turnout. Good to see so many of you here today. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Paul, Steve, Grant, Ram, Phil, Brian. All right, guys. Hey, let me know your questions. <laughs> Let's make this uh, good for you guys. Uh, I can give you, you know, my techniques and all that, but let me know what kind of questions you might have about trading. Like, what's your biggest pain in the rear when it comes to trading? Well, stop losses, right? So pick better charts. But uh, what kind of questions or challenges are you facing in our, our markets today? It's been such a good time to trade, and we've got such good volatility lately, right? Um, for example, uh, ranges yesterday. We had a bigger range uh, yesterday, uh, I should say Thursday, than Friday. One of the quick tips, one of the cure-alls for everything uh, in trading is make sure that you're trading wide range days and charts which which have bigger trading ranges and are in trend versus counter trend for example yesterday was nearly impossible to trade very narrow range a very grind way up but on thursday with a much bigger range and one thing that you'll find when you look at your daily charts is you often have and this is very kind of little known to the the public unless you've done this for a lot of years is in general you have alternating and look, look at this here's the s p here's the spiders this is a very 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 valuable technique and i'll do this the first one of the of the morning frequently you'll find that you have alternating wide versus wide tradable days versus narrow choppy not as tradable days much like the day after gap is often a mean reversion or a narrow range for example, big day, you know, large candle, small candle, right? Large candle, small candle, large candle, small candle, large candle, small candle, large, small, large, small. So from a volatility standpoint, you have, often have alternating strength of the days. So what that tells me is if I had a really good day, say on Thursday, uh, and you know, I do not want to trade much on the Friday. If I had a really good day, say on a Wednesday, I'm not likely to trade as much on a Thursday because uh, things alternate. So that's a very valuable, and you have my word, that's a test it for yourself. Or better yet, go through your own PL and just visually mark out the days of the biggest winning days versus stop loss days. And look at your, just like put your daily PL in an Excel spreadsheet or just write down on a piece of paper, whatever, um, how much money you made versus lost day after day. And odds are you'll find that the, you'll have alternate, like maybe Tuesday, Thursday, you made money, but Wednesday, Friday, you lost money. So that's a very useful technique. Uh, it took me many years to figure that out. Hey, good morning. Hey, Dennis. So let's take a look at some setups. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If you have a really good day, one day, it's very valuable to it. You have my word. It's a, it did a 140 odd million worth of trades last year with PL proof on my website for my 1099 from Fidelity. And that's not even counting my interactive brokers and Ameritrade accounts. But um, so it's a writer down or at least remind, remind yourself if you had a really good day one day don't get because it's really disappointing if you have a, a nice green day and then you give it back the next day yeah you know, or if you have a nice green morning and you give it back at we're trading lunchtime so alternate alternate it's like a light switch on off on off something useful to think about so for example we had a nice green day here and if you for those of you who are with me remember on on that friday and even that saturday uh, I told people that the market was likely to go back down and that I would I was in disbelief that this would keep going up. And I was right. We had a shooting start and then we had a big sell off for about a week and a half, a slow grind up and then the drop again. So the market's overall relatively choppy and with the banking sector in turmoil because of uh, SVB and Credit Suisse and Deutsch and the rest of it, we've got lots of uh, volatility. Uh, usually in a downward trend in instruments like that. You know, hopefully nobody's trying to bottom fish Credit Suisse. Uh, it's only 87, it looked cheap at two, it looked a lot cheaper when it was half that much, right? Uh, so anyway, looking for 
bank. Now, how many of you agree with me that I think that the banking challenges that we have are likely to not only contagion the spread within the banking sector, especially smaller banks, but and tech banks, but um, also into other parts of our economy. I think that the run on banking, there's a, something like, I forgot the number of billions of dollars were taken out of banks by Americans this past week. Uh, people are making a run on the banks. That's very likely to spread contagion into uh, into other parts of the economy. So I'm not optimistic about there's going to be a big rally on Wall Street anytime soon. So let's switch our energy then to how to profit potentially from that. Now, one thing that I like is FAZ. This is my number one pick moving forward is our finance bear leveraged ETF. It goes up when banking goes down. Dun, 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 bomb. And I even wrote an article for Stocks and Commodities Magazine featuring this very chart. Um, and this is the example uh, on the 10th, I guess it was right here, the 10th, uh, when SVB uh, posted the fail, the banking sector plummeted and this instrument spiked up. Now, how many of you are trading FAZ or some other way of shorting finance? I'm just curious. A good question, Ed, saying why isn't the market really freaking out yet because of the banking crisis? It takes a little bit of time. Uh, the Handwriting's on the wall, and obviously you can see the price actions up here. Hey, Jim, take a remain in the banking system. Yeah, we'll see. It's a, the main thing is with, so remember I said this. I even wrote an article in Stocks and Commodities on this. Uh, remember that I said short banking here. And obviously, how would you, so the, how would you go about doing that? Okay, well, personally, I'd be looking at going long FAZ at any new high, say over to 2650, 27. A scale in over 30, maybe every two or three dollars. Now, one of the things that I wanted to mention is uh, one of my favorite breakouts, just before I get into the position sizing piece of what I'm going to talk about, is one of my favorite patterns for a breakout is a small candle followed by a large candle, like this. Okay. Often in an uptrend, you'll see a small candle followed by a large candle and then a continued move up. So that's a kind of a turn up the heat or get on the freeway and go faster kind of thing. So small followed by large and momentum goes up from there. So look for that pattern always. Here's even a doji followed by a larger candle. I like small like this. Now position sizing. One of the best ways to make a lot of money as a trader is to always, always feed your winners, starve your losers, right? Add money to the winning trades and take it away from the ones that are stopping out. So you should gradually scale in. Now how you do this is very much Often when I talk to my traders, uh, I find a big variety of how people scale in. Uh, I would urge you to start small and then snowball, right? Start small, snowball. So it might start off with know, 100, 200 shares. If it goes up another couple of points, maybe I'll double down, okay? If it goes up another couple of points, maybe I'll add 400. So martingale progression, like 200, 200, 400. Now I don't go up to eight, 1,632. I may just, uh, and this is worth writing down, how to say, to make money as a trader, you must scale. Um, the huge percentage is in your favor if you scale in to your winners, because that's the way you leverage uh, things that work out. And so, what you don't want to do, and I did this for years, is like, you know, like say, I buy 300 shares here and let it ride. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, you may have made a few hundred bucks, but if you bought 300 here, bought another 300 there, then you would have made much more profit as of today. And if you scale in up at new highs, you can make even more. Uh, but the thing is, you have to play with the house's money. So the first, the whole goal of your initial trade is to subsidize any pullback or reversal that goes against you and causes you to go to cash and, and sell all shares. So you have to be in the money before you scale. Uh, that's where the real money is made as a trader. Now, ask any Wall Street guy, ask me, ask anyone. The real money, every time you trade, every time, at least I trade, I always look at, and especially for a swing trade, I look at it as being the first of a series of maybe two, three, even four trades. So that's a big change in how a lot of people approach. A lot of traders, they treat it like, they treat stock trading as though it were a uh, slot machine. You know, they put money in and pull a handle and, hey, I hope I get paid. That's not how professional trades. Uh, you start really, really small. You trade a variety of five, six different plays. Uh, and then scale in over time. So that's that's just a quick tip. So every trade should be seen as a sequence. How would you build a sequence of trades here? I call it a ladder. Let's say you're not in yet. Okay, I brought it to your attention. You say, okay, maybe, maybe he knows what he's talking about after all, because uh, he said to buy it back at 19, um, and now it's 20, or 18, and now it's at 26. 
how would you trade from here? I mean, is it too high? Is this the high and it's going to go back down to 18? Um, highly doubtful. With banking, banking contagion fear moving. If you look, for example, in a long-term chart, you can see back in the COVID high, it was hundreds of dollars a share, split adjusted, right? Up at a split adjusted uh, two, 300 a share. Now on sale for only 24 bucks a share. So um, there's plenty of upside in this chart. So how might one build a sequence or a scale? Maybe, and I'm gonna take questions here because I only have about 15 minutes left. Uh, and we'll look at some other charts, but for example, I would on this priced instrument under 50 bucks a share, I will usually scale in every two dollars or so, two maybe three dollars. So if I buy say 26 and a half, I'll buy 28 and a half. I'll scale in at 28 and a half. You don't scale in too close because then you get shaken out. You have to use a break even stop on your second uh, position and beyond because you're always you're you have to be above your cost basis on your entry. So if I buy 2650, let's be real crystal clear. If I purchase 2650, my initial stop would be down to say 2450 uh, or so, two points down. If it goes in my favor, uh, which it probably will, uh, I buy 2650, I double down at 2850. Okay. And at that point, I pull my trailing stop in at 27.5 so that I'm break even. So you buy 2650, then 2850, trail the stop at 27.5. So you're break even. And if it craps out and goes down, it's a wash, didn't cause you anything, uh, that's fine. But if it then keeps going up and we scale in at, say, 3050, it would be a third trade. That might be it, right? Maybe it goes up there for another couple of dollars, 33, 34, it stalls, starts to come down. You say, hey, let me take the money and run. That's how you make a winning sequence of uh, swing trades. Okay, and this is the best instrument I know of out there right now, I think, to do that to short finance. Now, if we look at some of the other charts, like our UVXY, it's been up and down, but with our VIX up, it's uh, our VIX has been way up lately, right? Our volatility index has been as high as 30 lately, which is it took it forever to get back up there. As long as the VIX stays over 20, uh, we want to stay short the market, right? A loss of 20, actually, 22 is kind of a warning sign, but if it gets under the 20, uh, 22 and 20 are kind of two key levels on the VIX. If we lose the 20, okay, we'll, we'll flip long. But as long as we stay above 20, and especially if we break this uh, upper tail and get up over the 25, 26, we want to aggressively go into our purchase, our inverse uh, ETFs and or buy puts or do whatever we can want to short the market if this goes up above that resistance. But the main thing is 22 and up, it's a bear, bearish market. So what are some charts that we want to play in favor of that? Well, one that I like a lot is our semiconductor <coughs> inverse Soxes. Uh, it's down near support. We have a hammer down here. It hasn't lost a hammer low. So it's you, one price point that I like to do is above the multiples of 10. So I never buy nine on a swing trade. So not by 19 because a lot of people fade that or they, they sell in that region. But if it gets over 20, and then in 22, then 24, it's got plenty of upside. This thing is double where it's at uh, just a couple of months ago. It's shorting semiconductors. Or if you want to play things to the long side. SOXL, if it keeps going up over 1850. I doubt it will. I think we're at a uh, top in the long bias instruments, and we're likely to fade back. So, But if it goes up, we're going to play it up there. Now let's take a look at a couple of intraday charts. And uh, let me know any questions. I've got a really big turnout. And I wanted to cover what we can while we've got some time together. Because there's so many patterns to learn. The do's and the don'ts of both day and swing trading um, makes a big difference. See so a trader, okay. Scott's asking, how do I set stops on intraday? Uh, well, good question. One of the things that I like to do is no more, never more than say 20 cents on uh, anything under 50 bucks a share. On these, uh, if you do trade these cheap stocks, like the, I usually stay clear stuff under 10 bucks a share. But one of my traders had mentioned this one. He's a really smart trader. And this thing doubled in value yesterday, right? SI, it went from a dollar to two dollars. So one could have done pretty well with that. One strategy that you may have seen me publish in Stocks and Commodities on is the whole number strategy, where we buy right above a whole number, like the 10, the 20, the 30 cent uh, above a whole number, and then we sell, let's say the 80 or 90 cent under the nearest whole number, right? So what you're really trying to do is put together a price action map where you're, you're trading within the whole number ranges. 
So always look at whole numbers as kind of a, a brick in the wall and try and make your trades live within the range of the whole numbers. Now, I don't like these cheap charts, the $1 charts. I, I tend to trade stuff 8, 10, 15, 20 a share. Uh, but this is, still illustrates the principle very well. Uh, you buy right above a whole number and you arbitrarily tighten up a trail stop or just go to cash once it gets to, say, the 90. And you may say, well, what if I miss out on the last bit of run? Well, yeah, but this is usually what happens. It'll go up and then chop and come back down. If it does keep going up, you can always get in again up over the nearest, the next whole number, say at the 220 or so. Um, but this is a kind of the life cycle of the trade is above the whole number and out at the nearest range. We have so many good charts to work with. And the challenge, of course, is trying to stay on top of these in a way that makes sense with charts that have really reasonably good volatility. Now, this type of chart is a good example of my least favorite chart, which is an inside chart. I do not like trading things that are inside the previous day's high low range. And if you go back over your own profit and loss statement, your own P&Ls over your last 20, 30, 40 trades, uh, and look at the winners versus the stops, I won't say I can guarantee you, but I will say the odds are likely that the majority of your stop loss trades were done when it was inside the previous day's range. Those are bad. So do not trade unless it's up at a two-day high, because that's the kind of chart you get. Untradeable, right? Untradeable. Horrible charts, right? So you don't want to trade stuff that's inside the range. You want things that are above or beyond the previous day's range uh, for high volatility plays. Here's another quick tip. When it comes to swing trading, the correct place to enter a swing trade is, uh, well, I say you can enter anywhere during the day, but the correct place to make decisions on your swing trading is to do what, I, what the, large, the big money traders do, and that's make your decisions as to whether to buy, sell, or hold during the last half hour of the day. You may have heard the saying, and it's very true, amateurs control the open, professionals control the close, and that's very true, especially when it comes to swing trading. And the neat thing is, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I like to trade before and after the market as well. And so you don't have to scramble to get the order in by four o'clock because it's open for another few hours if you've got extended hours enabled on your account. So uh, what I like to do is I will make a decision as to whether or not to buy either sell shares that I already have, don't trade it at all, or buy new shares. And the decision to buy new shares is always, if it's, a, now this technically doesn't meet the criteria, but if it ends the day above the previous day's high, that's why you need the two-day chart. So this is almost met criteria. If it ends the day, say, up here, then it's a buy. And this is still okay because it's kind of close enough. But in general, you want to just, as a rule of thumb, only purchase shares, only hold overnight. So this is another writer downer. Remember I said this. Write this down, and you'll thank me, I'm sure, a few months if you apply it. Only hold things overnight that, are, that end the day above the previous day's high. Okay, or at least only trade large, only hold overnight large size if it's about if it ends the day at four o'clock, wherever that is, it's above the previous day's high, right? So if it if it ends the day in the middle, you go to cash. If it ends down, you definitely have to subtract out of the trade. So, and I again I wrote an article in Stocks and Finance on that kind of inverted head and inverted uh, traffic signal with the green, yellow, and red. So uh, if it ends the day up here near the high. You either initiate a new trade or add to your existing winning trade. If it ends the day in the middle, it's chop. Either if you're in, you leave it alone. If you're not in it, you do not buy. And if, it, if you're in and it ends the day at the low, you must think back to, to all your stop losses. Think back to your biggest, most painful, most expensive, most frustrating uh, stop losses for swing trades. And if you had applied that simple tip, of always at least incrementally scale out if it ends the day uh, under the previous day's low, you would have dramatically likely reduced your stop loss cost, right? So uh, starves, the, starves the losers. If you're in a swing trade and ends the day under the previous day's low, thou shalt take some of that trade off. You don't, it's up to you how much you want to take off. I mean, and that's discretionary. You know, let's say you're in 500 shares and it ends the day down here. Well, let's see. I'm trying to think of one that I'm trying to find an example for us. Okay, so let's say you're in the stock slot ends the day down here. You would let's say you're in 500 shares. Well, as of that day, you would have to like be take off, uh, stop out of say one or 200 shares. So 
instead of 500 shares, now you're only in 300 shares. And that's the right decision on that kind of progression, right? If it's going in, if you don't stop out entirely, at least take some off the trade. So that's another very useful technique when it comes to swing trading is, you know, feed the winners, starve the losers. So make sure that you are scaling in and or adding at the end of the day. Because again, for swing trades, it doesn't really matter where it goes, the gyrations, the up and down gyrations of the day, you may buy it on a breakout in the morning, but if it gives it all back and ends the day red, you don't want to hold on to it, right? So you want to make sure that you're scaling out at the end of the day appropriately. I see a question from Andy. I would say William's asking, oh, I want a lot of questions. So Bill's asking, do I like to use flags? Yeah, sure. Uh, oftentimes you'll see uh, flags or uh, pennant patterns or the ones that I don't like are the uh, expanding range breakouts. That's like an inverted pennant where it has higher higher highs and lower lows. It makes for a frustrating day. The other thing you want to do too is mark out channels. You know, I'm a big fan of this fellow Carter Worth on uh, CNBC. He's like the only person I like on CNBC, but um, that because he's smart. Uh, it's a smart idea to mark out channels for support and resistance. So that way you don't over trade inside the range or at least you buy support and sell resistance. So if there is an observable channel, mark it out and trade accordingly because odds are like here, we marked out the, the chart here for our traders in the, in the room and it held the same exact channel support resistance throughout the day. So that's another way to kind of forecast where price action is going to go. Okay, let's take a look at some swing trading charts. Uh, do you, any of you have any tickers? Ah, that's funny. Hey, Barry's saying, he hasn't been around this past year. I offer, I offer more than 20 minutes than most people even know. Oh, thanks. Well, it took me 20 odd years to figure all this stuff out. So it's a, hopefully it can help. So for example, when Deutsche Bank ended the day yesterday with 35 million shares down, down here, that's not good, right? That means a lot of people are dumping it. Try and, try and fight the temptation to be a bottom fisher. Instead, be a strength buyer. So for example, my number one pick, and I'll go on record as saying this happily, my number one pick for something that I think is going to go up almost for sure is to short finance with the FAZ. I called it back at 18 and boom, it went up eight points. Uh, I still think it's good to 40 or 50 at least. So keep an eye on that. Okay, let's take a look at some charts here for you guys. Thanks. So I'll tell you whether or not I would trade that. No. The other thing is make sure on the 90 day chart, the range should be as close to two to one as possible to make the profit uh, potential worthwhile, the risk reward. So something like this, Exxon, I would not trade it because you're paying $100 a share for something that only has a 10% range. So regardless of what the chart says, the math is more important. So it's fired. Coinbase, we cover this often. Good for day trading, not for swing trading because it's too uncertain and there's too much risk in that chart. Too many points of risk. So good for uh, intraday, but not for swings. Facebook. That's actually a pretty decent chart. It's got almost a two to one ratio. Even though it's got a couple of a shooting star followed by a dozy up there, actually a double shooting star. <coughs> Anywhere with a 210, 212 uh, makes sense. So actually, I like Matter. That's, that's not too bad. Let's see what we got. Newmont. Gold in the hells. They were buying gold up lately. It's, we're back in the middle of the range, though. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I like GDX better, but um, gold is just okay. I'd give it maybe a C. Let's see. Take a look. Someone's asking on Amgen. No, remember, folks, only ask about charts for which the right side of the chart, the numbers on the right side of the chart, are close to two to one. So for the low is two twenty, the high better be four fifty, and it's not. So the range is in the leverage is a fail. Apple's great. It's a wonderful chart. It doesn't have the range, but it's got a nice tight trend. So may give it a pass. It's a, uh, it's a good chart. I don't see anything objectionable to it. We have a shooting star a couple of days ago, but you know, it's still in an uptrend. So obviously it would be worth looking at over say 164. So I like it. I, I would like it better if it had a wider range. Let's see. Someone's asking about Owen Owen. Yeah, that's a great chart. Yeah, that's a rock star. That'll play. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'll put that one in for my my room too. I like that one. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. We got green candles. Oh, by the way, that's another quick tip I mentioned to my live room members yesterday was 
uh, always give preference to charts that have green candles, right? So uh, we've got good uh, a ratio of, you know, at least uh, two thirds or three fourths recent in the last week for swing trades. Uh, you don't want to trade some, this is very valuable too, another good tip. Look at the last five days of color of the candles in the chart that you're considering swing trade. At least four out of five should be green. Minimum three out of five, preferably four, four out of five or all five like this. So that's good. And it's a nice multi-point range uptrend. So the volatility or the uh, the leverage is fine. Uh, low is 16, high is 32. So it is a two to one. So that's good. That's a good chart. I'd play that. I'd hit that. That, that one's good. Oh, and on. Let's see. AMD, American Micro Devices, a leading chip maker. Um, no, it's not quite two to one, but it's a good chart. I like it. It's healthy. It, it's going to struggle here near the 100, as you can see with a couple of shadows. They, they always do. That's why we don't buy nines. Like I would never buy 96, 98. I would not have bought 96, 98. Now that it's put in a high right near 102, a breakout over, say, the 103, 104 uh, would, be, uh, would be good. This is a nice uptrending chart. AMD continues on up. Although it's not a two to one ratio, it's kind of close, maybe, uh, you know, close to it. So a new high is good. That's, that's got good range and good volume. Let's see. Someone's asking about Eli Lilly. No, that's a horrible chart. It's a down chart that's bounced lately, and it doesn't have the leverage. You're paying three hundred dollars a share, and it's only got a, a three ten to three seventy leverage. So that's not too good. Let's see what else. My usual favorites: DraftKings. Nope. Peloton. Nope. Bed Bath and Beyond was up a bit yesterday, and then down. You might want to keep that one for a meme stock on the plane. No, GameStop was up. And uh, so was uh, AMC lately. So a couple of a couple of momentum runners lately. But uh, really, you want to be careful in this market because there's so much uncertainty and so many charts that are problematic. You really want to focus on charts like this one uh, or charts that have continuous uptrends with reasonable strength. Um, so that one would be good. I hit ON ON, and I like the the finance bear to the FAZ. Hey, Larry, it's your thing, man. Good to have you here. Yeah, I will. I will. Hmm. I have to figure out how to elevate your status here. Hmm. Good question, Larry. Let me see. Okay, here we go. I'm I'm trying to get Larry McMillan promoted here. There we go. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so now you're a panelist. Now you can talk. There you go. All right. Okay. So, like, hey, there you are. Good to see you here, sir. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, Ken. How are you? Uh, going through a divorce and getting taxes paid, it's, 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 it's always something, right? But uh, uh, it's always fun. But, but at least the market's are always there for us, so that's good. How about yourself? How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. All right, so uh, the, you're on a live mic here. We got a really big turnout today. It's a, I, I wish, it, again, I apologize I didn't get the six or seven speakers like I normally get, but I guess people are off doing their taxes and didn't have time. But uh, thanks for making time uh, for being here with us. Uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. It's uh, uh, great having you here, man. Uh, uh, traders, uh, we've got Larry McMillan in the house, one of the world's top, uh, if not the top, options experts. So uh, great to see you here, Larry. I always pick up a lot from you, and especially your thoughts on the VIX. Uh, um, but yeah, let's uh, go ahead and... If you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. All right. I think you have to uh, either stop screen sharing or enable my screen sharing. I think probably if you just stop yours, or I can probably do it. Mine is just saying post disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Let me make you a co-host. <laughs> this is so complicated, right? It's, I remember GoToWebinar. This thing, I'm still good to hang out. Let's see. Go host and... You should be able to. Let's see. 
Okay, now it says this will stop the other screen sharing. I guess that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> go, take it away. Okay. Here, let's go. <clears throat> all right, do you see that all right? Yes, yeah, it's coming through great. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to spend the next half hour or so just talking about the market and what our option indicators are saying. We've had a number of new signals recently, so this should be uh, timely. Um, <clears throat> so let me click in here. Somehow I'm not getting the. Uh... Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Uh, all right, good. Uh, so just a little background on our company. Uh, started out as a derivatives research firm uh, about 32 years ago. Uh, in 2008, we moved into money management because we made a, a number of good calls on the financial crisis. And then we also do a certain amount of uh, education, things like this, or mentoring. <clears throat> Um, I'll, I'll come back to this later, but we we do have a special offer for you uh, today, and also the PDFs of this presentation will be available. Uh, this is the uh, website where those things are happening. So uh, there's four main indicators that I look at regarding the market. Um, the most important one is the chart of the S&P 500, but then we do some uh, option-oriented things with put call ratios. Uh, we have an option twist on breadth, and then the volatility uh, space, including VIX and uh, VIX features and things. So I have a very important rule, which I always adhere to, and that is oversold does not mean buy. So we had a number of oversold indicators, you know, I would say probably three or four weeks ago. A lot of them didn't become buy signals until let's just say last week. So uh, the market can continue to decline uh, for quite some time while it's oversold. So you, you really want to wait for confirmed buy signals. There's a companion to that, of course, that's overbought does not mean sell. Uh, we don't really have any overbought indicators right now that I think of, but uh, we certainly did in the beginning of February. <clears throat> Um, this is the, the long-term chart of the S&P going back a couple of years, and I just wanted to mark a couple of things on there. Uh, after we hit the uh, minus 35% decline in uh, March of 2020, we didn't really have much in the way of declines after that. A, a small one in December, uh, September of 20, then an even smaller one in September of 21, but then uh, right in the beginning of 2022, we broke out here, and uh, it looked like the market was going to head higher, but instead it fell back, and that was a false breakout. So we went into a, a bear market, and we've been in a bear market ever since. It sort of seemed like we had uh, ended it maybe here in January when we broke out again, and especially when we broke out over this 42 or 4100 level. But again, it turned out to be a false breakout as we fallen back. Uh, not only below 4,100, but below the uh, the apex of that triangle there. So uh, this is still a bear market, in my opinion, uh, from the S&P chart. Here's a zoomed in one year look, just a little bit closer look. You can see now that uh, we made these highs in early February and then a couple of other attempts here. So we have a downtrend line on the chart now, and uh, it's a new ser series of lower highs and lower lows. And again, that's a, a bearish formation. So um, in my opinion, this is still a bearish chart. It's gonna have to at least get back above 4,200 and really probably above 4,300, which is last summer's highs in order to change this uh, picture to a, a bullish one. These green numbers uh, along here are just the show you how much the market can rally as 550 S&P points uh, in a bear market. The, the rallies in bear markets are very strong, uh, designed to force you out, make you cover your shorts, and then the market goes back down to lower lows. So uh, that's the pretty much the case that was going on all last year. This year is a little bit muddier, but still, uh, we, we again now have a series of lower uh, highs and lower lows on the chart. 
We also do something that we call modified Bollinger Bands. Bollinger Bands are drawn on a, any chart. Uh, and they, for the definition of volatility, the Bollinger Bands use the standard deviation of closing prices. It turns out that most of the math guys like Black Shoals and that use a slightly different definition, which is standard deviation of daily percentage price changes. So that's what we're using because our business is based on options and we really need to agree with Black Shoals volatilities. So the modified uh, word comes in there. And so uh, we, we draw these bands on the chart. Here's the current chart. And let's, uh, let me see if I can, where's my, there it is. Uh, so right there, that top band, that's plus four standard deviations. And the band inside that is plus three standard deviations. So when we move outside of four and then back inside of three, that's a cell signal. So that was a pretty good cell signal back then. We also had one of those here in early February and it came all the way down and went below the minus four and then back above the minus three gave us a buy signal. So we have a new modified Bollinger band, actually we call them uh, because we, we have other criteria we lay on top of this. We call them a, a McMillan volatility band buy signal. So we have a new buy signal. These have a good track record. The, the letter, red letters there are successful signals. The one blue letter there is uh, unsuccessful. Uh, this one is green because it just started. We don't know where it's going yet. But the object or the target is for it to trade up to the upper band here around uh, this, uh, that band is currently around 40. 150. Of course, that band will move depend, depending on volatility and prices. But in any case, uh, we do have a new uh, MVB uh, buy signal. Uh, so just summarizing here, the false breakouts on the chart, I think they're still weighing on the market psyche. You don't hear that much about them, which is fine. Uh, but people are definitely aware that the market looked like it was heading strongly north and in fact turned around. So we have this new downtrend in place. Uh, there's resistance really from about 4080 all the way up to 4200. That was the area in February where it was trading and then it finally broke back down. So that's that's a resistance area. On the downside, we have support between 3760 and 3850. That's where it traded in December. So really, um, we're kind of in a trading range between those two areas. A strong move above 4,300, that would be bullish, and a move below those uh, support at 3,760 would be bearish. So we'll probably get that in the next couple of months. Um, and, you know, obviously we'll be on top of it. So right now we are maintaining a core bearish position because of the downtrend in the S&P chart, but we will trade other signals around it, just such as that. Uh, McMillan volatility band buy signal. Uh, by the way, if you like the concept of the MVB, the McMillan volatility bands, we we calculate them on pretty much everything every day and have a subscription service where you can receive the signals. Um, they 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 chart on trading view. You can see here where the, the chart is. Uh, this is a how it looks on trading view. You can see here's that most recent buy signal right there. There was the cell signal before it. There was the other cell signal I talked about earlier. This was the fail buy signal. This was a su successful buy signal. So uh, these little red and green arrows pop up on the chart when the signals are confirmed. Okay, let's move on to put call ratios. This is a very interesting and very useful uh, contrary indicator. So it, it was invented as a contrary indicator by Marty Zweig back in the 1950s when he was getting the volume out of ads that were run in Barron's from the put and call dealers. And essentially, if he noticed that if there was too much put buying, the market went higher. If there was too much call buying, the market went lower. So we quite try to quantify that. And we draw this. Uh, this is the equity only put call ratio. In other words, all stock options that trade over all... I think it's nine, but it might be more than that, U.S. exchanges. So a peak, a local uh, maximum in the put call ratio is a buy signal and a local minimum. So these are local maximums. These are buy signals. And a local minimum is a sell signal. And we have computer analysis programs that try to help us uh, identify a local maximum and a local minimum as soon as it occurs. Now, this one 
the S is slightly over from where the real low occurred because it took that long for the computer programs to uh, agree. This is the total put call, uh, the equity only put call ratio, what we call the standard. In other words, we're just using the volume of all puts and calls on stocks. You can see it made a little local maximum here last week, and the computer is saying that this is indeed a buy signal, that uh, it expects the ratio to go this way rather than that way. It uses uh, like a chess tree playing uh, logic to discern these things. We also look at the weighted ratio, which is where we take the options price times its volume, and so we, we can see how many dollars are being spent on bullish opinion versus how many dollars are being spent on bearish opinion. So this uh, also, it just had a little local maximum this week, and the computer is also saying this is a buy signal. But there's one big difference between this chart and the one I just showed you before. This chart got extremely, extremely optimistic. A lot of call buying forced the put call ratio lower and lower and lower and lower here, and gave us a, a sell signal from an extremely optimistic extremely overbought condition there at the end of February. I'm going to back up when you can see that wasn't the case with this chart. In fact, the standard chart just recently went to the highest level that it's been at since 2020. You can't, that's not on this chart, but uh, in other words, extreme uh, pessimism at the at the high level. So uh, they're, they're not an exact agreement at this point in time as, as regarding how much uh, contrary sentiment there is whether it's extremely pessimistic or just a little bit pessimistic. But in either case, in any case, they both rolled over with a local maximum, and that's a buy signal. So these are brand new buy signals from the equity-only put-call ratio, which I consider to be one of our better indicators. So, um, you know, we these are, as I said, very strong signals historically. We had those good sell signals um, in February, and now they've reverted to buy signals. So we'll see. Uh, but right now, we have taken long positions so, uh, uh, based on that as well. <clears throat> so what do we buy when we're uh, trading these things? Well, we uh, I tend, tend to buy an in-the-money option. I, I don't want to uh, be right about the underlying and be wrong on the option I bought. Uh, if I'm going out a little farther, say two or three months, which I might do on a put call ratio uh, trade, then I might just buy an at the money option. But again, an at the money option has a fairly high delta. A delta of a call measures, uh, you know, what percentage of the upside gain you're going to get. So a uh, delta of 70, for example, on this chart uh, indicates that, um, you know, the stock, uh, if the stock goes up by a point, the option should go up by 70 cents. And uh, so that's the kind of uh, result I want. I don't I don't want to see the stock go up and the option lose money because I bought it too far out of the money. Now, on TV, you see them spreading a lot. In fact, all the time. Uh, in, re in real life, you don't want to do that. Uh, you only want to spread if the options are expensive. By spread, what do I mean? I mean, instead of just buying a call, you buy a call at this strike, and then you sell a call at a higher strike. And so when you do that, um, you're taking a little money from this sale, but you cut your profit potential off at the higher strike. So cutting your profit potential off is a seriously, can be a seriously negative thing. The red line here indicates what a call buy would look like. The black line is the spread. So why would you want to do that? Well, a lot of times this is where you're risking less money. You're not. You're risking 100% of what your broker requires to do those trades. If you buy a call, you put up the cash. If you buy a bull spread, you put up the cash, 100%. If you lose, you lose. So if dollars is what you're worried about, then instead of buying five bull spreads, maybe buy four calls and uh, have the unlimited upside potential. You can also uh, mitigate. So when options are expensive, though, it does make sense to spread. And so we've been spreading a lot with spies uh, options because VIX has been high pretty much uh, for the last year or so, relatively high. And so there are two ways to mitigate the negative effects of that spread. One is to spread the strikes farther apart. So right now in call options on SPY, if we're doing a spread, right, the, the uh, two strikes would be 15 to 20 points apart. If we're doing puts, since 
they're even skewed more steeply will do the strikes 25 to 40 points apart. And in addition, if you're right, let's say you put on the bull spread, you buy a call, sell a call, and now the, the underlying moves all the way up to this strike where you, you sold the call, roll the entire position, take the profit on that spread, and put on a new spread higher to because you're just about ready to cut off all your profit potential on that spread. So those are two ways to mitigate the negative effects of a bull spread. What about individual put call charts? So we, we do a lot with these as well, but we only use the really extreme readings, the really extreme local maximums, the local minimums as uh, trades. So this is Catalan CTLT. You may never even have heard of it, but we have had two really good signals. We had a sell signal last August. Uh, so you can see the local minimum at a very extreme level, the, the lowest level that had been on this chart. And that, so that got us, you know, this whole bit there. Meanwhile, while the sales, uh, while the market is going down, of course, everybody's buying puts, driving the put call ratio up. Eventually, it forms the local maximum here, also at a very extreme level. Uh, in fact, 900 on this chart. This is a weighted put call ratio. So that means that $900 are being spent on puts for every $100 being spent on calls. So that's very pessimistic. And of course, this is a contrary indicator. So we buy there. It took a little while, but it did take off finally. Uh, aided by a takeover rumor right there. Just got a little lucky. And then um, we sold out there. Now we're watching again in the takeover room generate a lot of call buying and we come back and we, yeah, we've got another local minimum a new sell signal and you can see the stock is just now broken below a support area so we're buying puts on cattle and as of yesterday actually and then this is another one car um, it has given a series of sell signals down here at a very low level but now we see the put call ratio is finally broken out and starting to move sharply higher even though uh, the stock is only modestly reacted, but we're buying puts on that one as well. Here's another one that's of interest. We don't always just jump in when the put call ratio signal is given. Here's Win Resorts. You can see that there was a good buy signal off the local um, local maximum last summer in July. <clears throat> that was here. Uh, but now it's come all the way down and, and rolled over. Give, made a local minimum there at the beginning of March. So we'd like to buy puts, but I was looking at the chart and by the time we saw this, that we had this low here and a low here at 105 and it bounced. So we don't want to really buy the puts unless it breaks 105. And if, if you're into standard technical analysis, you can see that that's almost a head and shoulders formation if it falls below there. Well, that could be a quite a negative move, but we're not going to buy puts unless it falls below 105. And finally, uh, we can do the same thing with futures options. Uh, the blue line here at the bottom, put call ratio line is the corn options that trade on the Chicago Board of Trade. But you don't have to trade uh, corn futures or corn options there. You can trade the ETF corn a, a, as well. And so there was a local maximum here a couple of weeks ago and we bought options on CORN. It's only just started to move higher, so you can probably still get in on that one as well. All right. Um, next thing we look at is market breadth. So <clears throat> we, you can do a couple things with breadth. The simple thing is you just keep, you subtract advances minus declines, you keep a running total. So that's cumulative breadth. There's another thing you can do, though, is uh, so keep an oscillator. So we do that. And our oscillator value today uh, is... That's supposed to be today. Is 90% of yesterday's oscillator value plus 10% of the difference between today's advances and declines. So typically you would use New York Stock Exchange data and calculate this oscillator. The problem is there's a lot of things on the New York Stock Exchange that are not options. So we were looking for a good set of just stocks and of course optionable stocks came to mind since we're an option firm and so we use what we call the stocks only uh, data set as being uh, all it's only all stocks uh, that have listed options on them there's almost 6,000 of them right now so more than trade on the New York Stock Exchange actually so um, this is the oscillator that we've created with that as going back about nine years here 
uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, more than that. Well, no, 10 years, I guess. And um, the green area is oversold. And for a long time, the market really wasn't hardly getting oversold at all. We're in the midst of a big rally from 2009 through last year. Now you can see that once the bear market started, we had a lot more oversold conditions arising. But remember, as I said before, oversold does not mean buy. Uh, the three most oversold conditions in history, at least according to this chart, uh, that was that December 2018, right before Christmas, the market was terrible. That was March 2020, the pandemic. And then last summer, uh, it got very oversold as well. So right now, we are still oversold. We're, we're over here right now, uh, coming off the sell signal that was generated up here on, on February 16th. And we're looking for this thing to bounce up get out of oversold territory, and that would be a new buy signal. But right now, uh, it's oversold, and oversold does not mean buy. So we're in an oversold condition here on a sell signal. Uh, that's not a new sell signal, but that's where we are. So that basically just uh, says everything, except for the one, one thing here. This is a very whipsaw -y type of indicator. So if you're a subscriber, you'll see that we often wait for a two-day confirmation of a signal before acting on it uh sometimes we'll have like one day it looks like a buy signal that reverses pretty quickly the next day and you know that's the way this market is acting anyway so uh a little extra confirmation never hurts new highs versus new lows is another thing we look at and again we look at three data sets we look at the new york stock exchange we look at our stocks only data set which is all stocks uh, with listed options and then we look at nasdaq and uh, the sell signal is given when the new lows go uh, or rise above 100 and new highs are uh, below 100. So that was a sell signal given right there in early March. That's still in effect right there. Actually, March, uh, well, I says, oh, well, yeah, uh, March 13th, I guess it was. So not that early in March, but middle of March. Uh, and you can see the numbers are much worse if you look at the uh, NASDAQ and the stocks only data, uh, a lot more uh, red numbers there. New York Stock Exchange, again, there's some odd things that can be going on there, especially with interest rates. Sometimes they'll move the opposite way and move ETFs that based on interest rates the opposite way. Uh, there's also convertible bonds and things like that on the New York Stock Exchange uh, advanced decline data. But in any case, this, uh, this gave a sell signal back in April 22, which lasted for eight months and, and reverted to a buy signal in, um, in uh, January of this year. And now we're back to a sell signal again. So, you know, it's uh, not an indicator that jumps around a lot. It's more of an intermediate term indicator. And this, this, this is the newest sell signal uh, that we had. So let's spend the uh, last few minutes here uh, discussing uh, volatility indicators. VIX is the volatility index. And the trend of VIX is very important. It should be trending opposite to the market. And also spike peaks in the VIX chart are buy signals. Usually people panic and then realize, oh, I overreacted and the market, you know, re reverse back up. So here's the current S&P chart. Most recently we had a uh, a spike peak buy signal here, and it's still in effect. That's why the letter is green. You can see VIX came up here, spiked all the way up to about 31 and then back down. These are the closing prices in here. So that's a buy signal, uh, and that would last for uh, a month unless it stopped out. So we, we run a trailing stop on these. Uh, red letters are successful signals, blue are not. You can see the bear market has uh, not been as kind to this indicator as uh, bull markets were, but it has a long and successful uh, track record. We've been trading it in the option strategies, well, really uh, since VIX futures, probably even before VIX futures came along. So we have hundreds of trades and it's a very successful indicator overall. And it is uh, right now on a buy signal. As I said, we're running a trailing stop. So if VIX starts to jump higher, uh, that would be a problem. Here's your 200-day moving average of VIX. And right now, VIX is below there. And so is the 20-day moving average, which is right here. So that's what gives us our trend of VIX buy signal. If one of these two moves back above 
the 200 day, then that would stop that buy signal out. So we have, we have a spike peak buy signal and we have a trend of VIX buy signal. Um, <clears throat> you may have noticed, let me back up on that chart. You see it's bottomed in the last couple of years, right around the 19 level, maybe a little bit lower uh, here this year, early this year. But in years past, it would go, you know, in a bull market, VIX was going down to 14, 12, 10. So the fact that VIX is holding up at these pretty high levels uh, indicates that there's some worry in the market still. Um, if they're really, if people thought everything was going to be fine and inflation had peaked and all those other things, then, um, you know, VIX wouldn't be trading up at this level. Uh, speaking of inflation peaking, I'm just going to give you a quick little side here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the people that <clears throat> when you watch CNBC, and you see the CBNBC, CNBC economic survey. I'm one of the people that surveyed. There's about 30 some of them. I'm the only person that thinks uh, inflation hasn't peaked yet. I th that seems unusual, doesn't it? I mean, you, yeah, you might have. It's, a, it's a kind of looks like it has the last couple of months, but you know, for peak. Period, just yeah, not not any qualifications on that. Just say it's peak. So uh, to me, that indicates that if some bad news comes out about uh, about inflation, it's going to be even worse from the market than normal because everybody is already thinking inflation is peak. Anyway, uh, we also look at the futures uh, derivatives. You can't trade VIX, but you can trade the futures, and you can trade the uh, uh, VIX options. So uh, VIX futures form a term structure if you look at their prices. And when they're sloping upwards like this, as you go out in time, that's bullish for the market. If they're sloping downwards like this, like it happened in March of 18, that's bearish. So we keep an eye on the term structure. And here's last night's closing prices for the VIX futures and VIX. VIX is 21.74. The April, which is now the closest front month future, if we subtract off 21.74, we get a premium of $1.15. So you can see that these prices are sloping upwards, still about right there, and then it's mixed after that. So the term structure uh, was flattening out last week, especially when the financial mini financial crisis happened about a little over a week ago, and it's starting to slope back upwards again. So I'd say this is modestly bullish. It's not wildly bullish. The CBOE publishes five indices, volatility indices, uh, from a nine-day, VIX is a 30-day, and then there's three longer-term ones. And this is where they closed last night. You can see they're all sloping upwards out in time. So that's an upward slope. That is bullish. So we kind of put these two together, it's moderate, moderately bullish. What we really keep an eye on is the front month April futures trading at 22.89 last night versus the May futures the next month at 23.95. So as long as May is above April in price, everything is fine. If that inverts, especially if it inverts by say a dollar or more, then you've got trouble. And uh, that, you know, back in, some of the more severe declines we've had in, in history, that thing has inverted badly, like 16 or 18 points. It presents a number of profit opportunities to traders, but it's not good for the market overall. Um, so summarizing here, uh, on the bearish side, we've got the chart of the S&P, which we started out with. We've got those breadth oscillators are still on sell signals, and then the new highs, new lows recently gave a sell signal. Countering that, and we are trading these two as well, there's that MVB, the modified uh, the McMillan volatility band buy signal uh, on the S&P chart. The construct of volatility derivatives that we just looked at, that's bullish. The trend of VIX is, is bullish. Uh, and the equity only uh, put call ratio is, uh, those all gave buy signals as well. So, but somewhat balanced. And as I said, we are trading uh, a core bearish position and we trade other signals around that. The, um, I guess the bottom line is that neither the bulls or the bears have, have uh, engineered a pretty large movement uh, in recent months. I mean, there's the rally at the beginning of the year was pretty strong and the decline since February is pretty strong, but they're not really you know, huge moves like we saw last year. Um, 
many of you know that I think this market is very similar to the 1973-74 uh, bear market, which went on for uh, a year and a half, three quarters from the, a, a, you can see on, on the left side of this chart, there was also a false breakout to an all-time high, and that was January of 73. And went through all these various things before eventually bottoming in October of 74 uh, when Jerry Ford, who was then president, after Nixon had resigned, Nixon resigning caused a big drop in the market, That this, this drop right there. <clears throat> um, he had this whip inflation now campaign. <laughs> And sure enough, the market bottom, inflation wasn't beat. Inflation went higher for uh, eight years after that, but still uh, inflation going higher was, you know, was bad for the market, certainly initially. Where are we now on this chart? I think we're about right there. We've tried to uh, break out and reestablish the bull market. It hasn't happened. We've fallen back, uh, but we haven't fallen back below the previous year's lows. So, you know, we're, we're somewhere in, in, in this area right here, uh, if you believe we're sort of repeating that chart. Anyways, I mentioned this, so we're having a special offer, just pretty simple. You get the book, you get our uh, intensive home study course, which is 14 webinars, and then um, a couple of other things. So, and you can download the PDFs, get them all from going to this uh, URL right here. All right, Ken, let me turn it back to you. I think I've used up my time. Well, and you did an outstanding job, too. Thanks so much, Larry. It was a really good presentation. I, I was like, I learned so much from you every single time. And I know we've been doing these together for years, and I always pick up new stuff. So thanks so much. Uh, very highly recommend Larry McMillan. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Hey, thanks, Larry. Mm -hmm. uh, have a great rest of the weekend, man. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. A big okay. turnout today. Yeah. All right. I'll hit stop share. It should send it back. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, next up, we've got Bennett McDowell. Uh, Bennett, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Testing one, two, three. Let's see. Let me go ahead me? and yeah, yeah, coming through great. Okay, super. All right. Let me um, share my screen before I get going. Um, you have to, I, ha I think you have to turn me on for that. Let's see. Trying to figure out where, <laughs> where I do this. Um, I know, right? So many little things. Also, I got to find the chat area here. Here it is. Let's see. Just went away. I had it. Okay. I think. I think I'm okay now. Let's see. Hey, Larry. Good to good to hear your voice again. Boy, it's been a long time. Larry and I yeah. first met a long time ago at the trader one of the traders expos, and we met through Ed Schram from Stocks and Commodities. And Larry eventually wrote my. Um, forward to my first book uh, on the art of trading. Hey, Ben, Larry, how are you doing? I agree with, <laughs> yeah, how you doing? Good. And, and I totally agree with you on this market. I think we're in the beginnings of a tremendous bear market that will unfold. It's going to take time. <laughs> um, and, you know, we use a lot of Elliott Wave for that. So I'm thinking 40% down from here. Um, worst case scenario, maybe a little further, but um, it's, it's a, a bull market. Bear market rally right now. Um, Abs absolutely. Hey Bennett, your co-host now. A little higher. Uh, okay, Bennett, you good? should be able. To, yeah, you should be able to take control. But yeah, uh, I told. Me, I, I completely agree that we are only in the beginning phase of uh, inflation. I totally agree with that, and I completely agree with Bennett too. Hey, there you go. Uh, that we have a long right, ways now, down to go. So. Okay, give me one second. I got to find the chat area. All right, now audio is good, excellent. Okay. All right, so you can see my screen and everything, right? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. Well, I am ready to go when you tell me. <laughs> well, okay. I just wanted to introduce, uh, hey, everybody, uh, welcome uh, aboard. I wanted to introduce Bennett McDowell here from Traders Coach. Uh, I've known Bennett. I consider him a friend like Larry. We've known each other for since the dawn of time, it seems like forever. <laughs> we always run into each other. Know, right? he, yeah, yeah. He knows his stuff. He's one of the good guys uh, like Larry. So, uh, take it away, Bennett. I look forward to hearing what you got to say. So thanks for being here, man. All right. Th thank you, Ken. Good to be here. Uh, Larry, once again, good to hear your voice uh, live uh, for sure. Okay. So um, today I want to talk about uh, the fi financial freedom. And, you know, with trading the markets, we're different than the buy and holders, right? I mean, look at uh, Bitcoin up and then all the way down. So if you were a buy and holder, you wouldn't be too happy on that one. That's for sure. 
Uh, but you know, whether whether it's a ETF Bitcoin or a regular stock, it happens all the time. So you always, as a trader, have to be going in the direction of the momentum. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, because our trading tools that I design here are designed to do that. All right. It's pretty hard to miss a trend with our approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what's there. Now, the other thing, too, is at the end of the webinar, we offer a trial on our software. So stick around, and I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end. And so um, without further ado, let me get going. Here's my uh, face, and here's my traderscoach.com web website logo. Please go there and visit us. All the information is located there. And uh, here's a little bit about the 30-day software trial. So all the tools I'm going to show you today, whoops, all the tools I'm going to show you today uh, are be going to be available in the trial. So you're going to get uh, scanners and all this kind of good stuff, but I'm going to go over that later, okay? I want to get to the meat and potatoes here. All right, so as traders, like I said, we're not buying hold. Our job is to make money in bear markets and bull markets. So you have to have a strategy to do both. Only one way very limits you. And right now, since we're going into what we think is a long-term bear market, you kind of had to shift from being a short-term bull on this bullish rally to consider some trades now to the short side coming up pretty soon or take a long-term short like we did at the beginning back in February and then hold it until we get down to the uh, FIB levels that we think we're going down. So intentions on what you're doing are very important. That will determine your style and whether you're long-term or more short-term. I can tell you in a bear market, it is extremely difficult to position trade because there's so much volatility and that's what you're experiencing probably. All right, now, in order to do well, you have to have the right trading tools, okay? And you have to work smart. A lot of people will go into the market and trade their feelings or their intuitions, and you really have to have structure to do well. And this is where our trading approach comes in. So we have on the top row, all of our charting software, and then down here, we have all our scanners. And so you're going to see those because it's all about structure. As a trader, what we want to do is when we feel that fear and greed, we want to fight that. And the best way to fight that is through having a structured trading approach. And that's what the art system is really all about. Because if you don't have it, you're going to get eaten by this guy. Okay. And uh, there's no amateur markets when we trade. That's the difficult thing. It's not like being you know, paired up in tennis with somebody at your level. It doesn't work like that. Anytime there's money to be made in the market, you're going against the best. And if you're not prepared, you're going to get eaten. It's that simple. And it happens a lot. All right. So um, the art trading system really comes to the rescue in that because we cover what you need to know to stay structured. All right. And the art system includes the art charting software, the OWL indicator, which we call the optimum wave locator, the precision trend filter, the trend line master, the emotional reader index, and all the scanners. And the purpose behind all this, again, is for structure. And when we trade, what we do is we connect the dots. The more dots of these indicators indicating a confirmation of a certain direction of a trade, then the higher the probability is. So the more dots you connect, the better the trade. And so that's a good thing, right? So you don't want to necessarily jump in without that having that structure of connecting as many dots as possible. So when we talk about trading, I, I basically put it into four uh, general elements here. There's, there's more, but basically these. First thing you got to do is find the good trades. You know, you got thousands and thousands and thousands of stocks. You got thousands of other types of things these days to trade. So you have to know how you find them. And what we do is we use our scanners to do that. It does all the heavy lifting of sorting through the entire NASDAQ, the entire S&P, and it identifies trades based on our technical analysis that show up as good trades. And then we take a look at the charts. And then when we take a look at the charts, this is where the ART software, the OWL, PTF, TLM, and ERI indicators come into effect because we are trying to time the entry and see if the momentum is there yet. So we may get something that sets up as a good scan. Maybe it's bracketed, getting ready to break out. So we put that on a watch list. And then when it breaks out, all right, we hit it. OK, and so you don't want to be in a market when it's not moving as short term traders. We basically play the momentum. OK, that's really, really important. All right. So my screen is cut off on the left hand side. Is that one person or is that everybody? Um, 
everybody can see it okay let me know before i go go forward here shouldn't it shouldn't be <laughs> but you never know with these things it's okay all right thank you all right so entries and exits okay we're good to go all right so entries and exits are good um we have money management you know you have to have risk control if you don't have risk control you're not going to live very long in this business all right and then once the trade is on you have to monitor the trade with structure and once the trade is on here's what's difficult about this section of the pie is because so many people uh, are type a personalities that come into this business and they have a hard time letting go and not you know screwing around with the trade that's in you know how many times do you get out too soon based on tweaking and fear and all that kind of stuff so you have to have a structured way in which to exit the markets it's just as important as getting in and so trade monitoring is kind of like a passive yet aware type of scenario so you're looking at your tools but at the same time you cannot control the market and you have to let go and get out when it's time to get out regardless of what you're thinking okay so that's really important so these are the four areas that i focused on when designing my system and so again the key thing was structure all right we also want to be able to trade the markets as they unfold and this is where fractal symmetry and everything comes in because that's really important to be able to apply your trading system across all time frames that way you can day trade with it like we do you can position trade it like we do or you can use long-term charts to time a longer position so it's really important that your system works across all the time frames and if it's designed off price patterns and momentum type of uh, stats that are in the market and volume and things like that that's what you can do because you're going to have volume and those uh, things on all time frames in fact if I showed you a stock remove the x and y axis which is the time and the price you wouldn't know what what you were looking at if I asked you is this a futures market you would probably not know okay or is it a stock market and that's because price patterns repeat themselves on different time frames just as well as they do on different markets and that's where technical analysis comes in and looks at those patterns and identifies entries on that time frame so that's kind of what we're all about all right and it's all about reducing those emotional pulls that we feel all right so the first thing I'm going to discuss in our system here is called the art pyramids the art pyramids specifically are looking at price patterns in the market that I they identify the high probability trend trades that's really important because we take into account several factors, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. We also uh, they use them for stop losses, okay, where to set our stop. They form in pockets between support and resistance. Now, not every pocket has a support or a resistance that has as much meaning as probably another type. And they, the difference between the two is the momentum and some of the things statistically we look at when that pattern is forming so you may see a pyramid form in this pattern but not this one and then you might see it again there and it's because of all the processing going on in the formation of the pyramid that the software is taking into account so that's kind of important so if we look at what i'm talking about in terms of what a pyramid looks so here's this area where it pulled back and it's forming here right so that's what you're looking at here so the interesting thing is the first thing you notice about this pattern okay in terms of trend trading is this is low one this is high one this is low two and this is high two and what's the definition of an uptrend okay can't get any simpler than that higher highs and higher lows right basic but that's important okay so the buy point actually okay is it occurs when it goes above the top part of the pyramid which is identifying in this case a key level of resistance and so we want to be there okay it's the path of least resistance it's a fractal okay so you want to be there and you want to put your stop down here now the software is looking at momentum of this move up now momentum is how fast price moves over time it's not a factor uh necessarily people get confused between momentum and volume they're not the same okay you can have low volume and high momentum because everybody could just be buying okay so the price bar could be going up quite a bit um so we look at the momentum the ferocity of how big this move is then we compare it against the momentum down all right are the bears having as much momentum as the bulls on that first leg up then the most important leg is this one okay is the strength back in a big way compared to the strength on the left part of the triangle 
And is it strong enough to break the apex? Okay. So we also took into account through this one simple pyramid, the volatility of this pattern between here and here, right? So when we go long here, we immediately set our stop here because that should hold unless some new information has come in to cause the market to go below that. Then that's the path of least resistance and we want to get out. All right, so that is the design characteristics I put into the art pyramids. And it works extremely well. Now on the other um, situation, on a bear market or short trade, you just flip the pyramid. The pyramid always points in the direction of the trend and is highlighted by a major P, okay? But same, same dynamics, it has to take out the apex. Now, the reason you don't wanna go short on this price bar is because this may be actually going in this direction. So you wanna wait for that apex to be broken. You don't wanna go in too early, all right? So with the use of the pyramids, we're able to create a situation where we know our initial stop before entering the trade, and that's important for risk control because that's how we determine our trade size. And then the pyramids as they form on a trend allow us to move our stop up to the base legs of those pyramids. And so, you know, where would you put your stops on this? Okay, is the question. Um, some people, you know, will move, use a moving average, but I'm gonna show you a better way, all right? Here's the art system, okay? And notice, that all the dynamic P pyramids that formed as the market unfolds allows you to move your stops up. Now, these pyramids here are marked with an MP. They are telling you a correction is underway. You could use those possibly to scale out, but they are not telling you the trend has changed. Okay, you always adhere to the P pyramids. So in this example, real quickly, our first entry is here, and there's our initial stop under here. We moved our stops here, 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 here and here and get taken out here. Now think about the stress of that compared to not knowing where your stops are gonna be. You know, every time you get a pullback, you're gonna go, oh my gosh, the trend's over, okay? So by using momentum and the calculation of the patterns that form, it picks out the best ones and that's the key. Now, some people that use a moving average, for example, all right, maybe they use a 20 day or whatever, you would have gotten stopped out of this perfectly good trend often. And I used to use moving averages when I traded uh, a long time ago. I don't really want to say how long, but over 30 years <laughs> tells my age. Um, but in any case, um, I used to use this. I was always disappointed in using them because I was always stopped out too soon. So the pyramids really answered that question. And here they are being used on a short trade. And sometimes you go some distance before one, one um, forms because it's trying to give the market enough room for any volatility to not knock you out, okay? And here's your initial stop. We move our stop here, 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 and you'd still be short here, okay? And we have some reversals here, and I'm gonna talk about those in just a minute, but they are what we use, all right, to scale out if we want to, okay, at certain times. And we have a whole methodology behind that. And that leads us to the art reversals, which basically are determining key market pivot points. And we do use volume in this calculation and we do use momentum, but some markets like the Forex don't always have volume. So um, we rely on the market and the pattern. And we use these when markets are trending, okay? So if they're going sideways and we see a sideways channel and we have a range between up here and here, we try to ch ch trade in between the upper and lower ranges, using these type of um, pivot point entries, okay? All right, so that is the art system. And again, it focuses on price, the price patterns in the market. And you know, the reason why it's called art is art stands for applied reality trading is because price, volume, momentum are all truths to the market, okay? The footprint of the market that forms that pattern is based on reality. OK, so it's, you can't really distort that. And that's why I like, like to rely on price patterns for primarily telling me what to go. All right. So now we add kind of the confirmation signals, which we call the enhancers. And we kind of, you know, they're all abbreviated. Al, PTF, TLM, and ER. I was in the Navy. So I guess, you know, I, those acronyms carry over to me. So the OWL stands for the Optimal Wave Locator. PTF stands for the Precision Trend Filter. TLM stands for the Trend Line Master. And the ERI stands for the Emotional Reader Index, which gauges fear and greed at manic points. 
So when we look at a chart, okay, um, you know, here are the tools added. So you got the art system with the pyramids, right? Then you got all the indicators down here. And basically, you know, you don't want to go short unless the momentum is going in your direction. And you don't want to exit a possible short position unless, okay, in terms of unless you're stopped out by a pyramid or, all right, you are still in the trade and you're thinking about scaling out. You don't want to do that if that's red on the PTF. This indicator, believe it or not, has a 75% probability. So it's saying there'll be more lows. Now, it doesn't tell you what kind of correction we're going to have. It just says eventually there will be more lows. All right. So the pyramids all, always supersede any of the indicators at the bottom for getting out of the market. But they are very helpful when you're thinking about scaling out because sometimes you shouldn't. And that's where these indicators come in. And the G here are the greed bars forming in the market in certain points. And that's good to know for scaling out, too. All right. So now here's another one where a market is range bound. We found this with our uh, turbo scanner which looks for bracketed markets and even breakouts. But again, um, you want to try to stay out of this area until you get the break. And then you want to go look at the confirmations, all green, which is a good thing. Then you want to go, okay? And then you follow the pyramid straight up. All right, here's some recent charts. I think I can slow down here now because I was worried about not having enough time getting through this. So this is gold, okay? I just took this chart this is, you know, Friday's close on gold, basically. Um, so here's uh, gold ETF, and it uh, has been moving up after it retraced. So here's a combination of technical tools we're using. All right, we do use the FIBS. We do use Elliott Wave. All right, so here's our pullback, and now we're moving up. Now, what's interesting here is that the momentum that created this owl, all right, is higher than the momentum back here. So that means that we're probably in a wave three uh, going up here. We'll have a pullback and maybe complete in that target zone right there. But, um, you know, the trade on this leg up, all right, was taken as soon as the owl turns green. And that basically occurred when the pyramid was hit. All right. And then you put your stop down here and now you can trail your pyramid up here. And when it gets to the target zone, then we watch these indicators again, especially this one at this point. And we place our stop to allow uh, it to go as high as it wants to go, because as long as this remains green, we know whatever high is in that green area is not the final high. And that is a big help in determining where to put your stops. You want to be aggressive or not so aggressive. That one indicator with a 75% probability rate comes to the rescue for that kind of information. All right. And here is the MES on a five-minute time frame from Friday. We do day trade. Um, these uh, futures, we tra they trade the MES, the MNQ, a lot of the micros. We like the micros uh, because it allows us to get a ton of contracts that we can use for uh, scaling and scalping out of positions at certain times when the indicators at the bottom weren't. So this was a trend trade. Notice the PTF is yellow, so you can go long or short on a yellow, but you want to make sure this is green before you go long. So as long as there's no red down here, we're looking pretty good. Main two indicators at time of entry we use are the OWL and the PTF. Sometimes we get in so early that the trend line hasn't had a chance to track yet. And that's okay. All right. So we kind of know, you know, if a trade looks really good, the trend isn't quite rolled over yet, we'll go ahead and take that. Maybe we'll reduce the trade size a little bit depending on the circumstances. All right. But that's kind of, you know, how we do that. And then here, okay. Um, let me just go one more. Sorry about that. Okay. And then here is a trade purely built off the PTF. And this, these are cool kind of trades. So basically what you're looking at really is kind of a scalp trade, but using the PTF indicator. So here it is down here, green. The market went up, made it green, came back down and channeled. Now, here's the thing about the PTF. It doesn't tell you how far the pullback is going to be. So you always have to use the art pyramids for that, okay? Uh, you have to have grounded assessments on when to get out. So we do that. Uh, but the PTF with a 75% probability is saying any pullback, all right, will be met eventually with the market coming bullish in this case and taking out that high. So when I show up to a market like this, when I scan for a channel, 
and then see the PTF like this, okay, I start to get really excited, okay, really, really excited. And so the reason I'm excited is because we had a tremendous pullback. We've had a channel looking pretty good for a breakout and to get up here, right? Now, if I showed up on this market and prices didn't pull down, they were right here, well, you're too, too close to the target, all right? You don't want to go in there. There's not enough profit versus risk that you take because you got to put your stop someplace. So here, we're getting a nice setup even on this pyramid here, all right, for a nice trade with a nice risk to reward right there, okay? And notice we're getting a bullish owl. So we're getting a bullish PTF. I'm happy about that. That's all I need for a long position. And now I wait for the pyramid, okay? And, you know, here's here it goes, okay? Boom, okay? It hit it. All right. I took the pyramids off this to make it clear so you could see how this thing moved up. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, a lot of people are asking me about the spider today. So Ashton is asking, can you can you scan spy to show us what the situation? Um, come to my YouTube live stock analysis Friday. OK, it's all in there. All right. So that's where we go in terms of. Um, showing you how it works on any market. You can bring any stock or ETF to that session. And I look it up and we have a lot of recordings. I think I looked up the spider on Friday. So you should check that out. Go to um, the traderscoach.com. I think it's a reality-based trading YouTube page. Become a, you know, subscribe. And then go to the most recent stock analysis Fridays in the playlist. And you'll find it there because we reviewed the spider there. Okay. This is just a PowerPoint today. So I don't have that. Up. All right. So that is how we use the charting software. But again, we don't stop there. My pleasure. OK, um, I just want to cover the indicators here because this is how the scanners look on NinjaTrader. OK, and we have a variety of different kinds. We have something called the trade confirmer. Now, you remember the Al PTF and TLM I showed you on those charts? Well, that those are built into the scanner. And so the nice thing about the trade confirmer is without opening the charts, you can see what those indicators are telling us in the scanner. And then you can set this little trade confirmer column up. And if you want to only see the ones that have the same color, you can set it up that way. Or if you want to just look at the ones with a bullish owl or PTF, you can set it up that way. All right. So kind of cool, right? Kind of cool. All right. Oh, good. Gene actually posted a link there to our YouTube page, so you can check that out. Thank you. All right. So that is that. And believe me, that saves a lot of time. So when you find something you like based on these scans, you go ahead and open the chart. So that's why literally you could have the entire S&P 500. All right. And if you have a very strict scan looking at Al PTF and TLM, you're going to get a handful of really good candidates. OK, next one is the Elliott wave. OK, depending on how you want to combine the different scans, uh, it's showing a bull wave three, which is not a surprise here. OK, so that makes sense when you have all three the same. So if you want to get in early, really early on a, a bull wave three, you might want the TLM to be um, not included in the overall scan. That way you can get in before the trend really super changes. OK, um, and then you have the turbo on the far right hand side, the turbo's design to take a look at all of the art pyramids and the art reversals, the art pyramids that are forming called unconfirmed. It's looking for bracketed markets because sometimes we like to look just for bracketed markets and see how long they've been bracketed. So you can set the bracket number up. Uh, let's say you want 20 price bars. I think the default is 20 price bars, but if you want to make sure the bracket is extended, you can set that up for more. Okay, kind of cool, right? All right, so um, that's kind of cool. And then um, our reversals are covered here. We also do consecutive pyramids. That's kind of neat too, because if we're in a wave three and we've had six pyramids, we may want to look at that for a possible trade to the downside. Let's say it's a bullish wave three with six pyramids. Normally we get at least four. We don't like to go into a trend after four. It's too mature. Okay, it's getting set statistically after four pyramids the trade actually becomes more risky. So you want to try to get in on the first two. Now you can add in on the three. We also pyramid into a trend uh, when we can move our stop up so our risk is not increased by adding in. Never add in um, 
and increase your initial risk that you want to take on the trade. Always add in when you can move that stop up and lock in the current profit on the initial trade. Okay, really important. A lot of people think, oh, I'll lower my cost basis, but you got to be careful with that because that also can increase your risk if you don't do it the right way. All right, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. Okay, so the, so if you run all four together, it's giving you a lot of information and you can combine, uh, for example, well, maybe I want to make sure I look at unconfirmed pyramids and I want to look at the owl and the PTF green. And okay, Elliott Wave, maybe I'll look at that, but maybe I don't need to as long as I can maybe get in early on a wave three. And then by the time wave three is more conclusive, it'll show up in the scanner type of thing. Okay. So, you know, you can use the scanners, mix and match them any way you want. That's the cool thing. All right. Let me wrap this up because I only got a couple minutes here and Ken is on a tight schedule here. All right, so the art software supported platforms. We work on TradeStation, we work on NinjaTrader, eSignal, MultiCharts, MetaTrader 4, and 5. Now, if you're using TOS or one of those uh, other type of uh, platforms, um, I recommend using NinjaTrader and importing the data from TOS. You know, you can do that. It's a free platform. You can download it and then import the TD Ameritrade and have your data that you're using on TOS uh, funneled right in. If you don't use any other platform, uh, Ninja Trader's got free end of day, and it's really good. Or you can, you know, purchase uh, lifetime data as well. But all our software works in there. So if you want to take a trial and you don't have any of these, use Ninja Trader, and we'll set you up. Okay, the trial includes um, free installation. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. Let me see. I have to put my marketing hat on now and post the link. Okay. There's the link for the trial. Okay. So if you take the trial. Um, it's actually um, $299 now. Okay, so there it is. And if you purchase the software before the end of the trial, you get 25% off. All right. So if you purchase, okay, any of the software, you get the 25% off. And the trial is $299. And normally we charge $399 for the trial. So this is a good deal. All right. And we also give you the free art home study course. And that is going to help you a lot because we talk a lot about how to implement structure. Okay. So you're going to know how all this stuff works. We've got manuals for everything, but it includes all the scanners and all the software I showed for you today. All right. So all this. All right. So this is the charting software at the top. There's the art system with the pyramids over here, right? Then you have the owl, the PTF, TLM, and ERI, which are sitting at the bottom of the chart. And then the scanners are right here. So we have a multiple time. Oh, I forgot to talk about the multiple time frame scanner. The multiple time frame scanner, real quick, I've got about 30 seconds, I think, Ken. Basically, what that does is it scans um, three time frames, any three time frames you want. So it takes a look to see if there's a trade on the first time frame or the second time frame or the th third time frame. So that's kind of a cool thing. And, you know, we've got a whole different uh, sort of uh, things we're looking at it, and it sits up here. Um, oh, well, sits up here on the scanner. OK, so that's where it is. All right. So let me leave it there. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Hopefully you found that helpful. But uh, the key thing is structure is a big deal in your trading. OK. All right. So. So, OK, um, let me put the link back in. I think. Oh, oh, I see. Gotcha. All right. I got to put everyone now. Kind of like. OK, so there's the link to everybody. Sorry about that, guys. So there's the link uh, for the trial. And I think everybody now can see that. Thank you for telling me that, Kelly. I appreciate that. All right. So that's great. And go ahead and click on it now because uh, I don't know if the links go away when I end. So click on it now. You can bookmark the page and it will tell you when this offer expires. Uh, I think we're running it just basically till the end of this session that you guys have with Ken today. So I think uh, the $299 is good only till the end of today's event with Ken. Okay. So there you have it. Okay, a uh, quick question on the specs you should have for trading laptop or desktop. Well, you know, I always recommend the i7 chips at least, okay, with enough memory. You know, everybody opens a different number of charts, but if you have um, at least eight gigabytes and running an i7 chip, you'll be okay. I mean, the more the more memory you have, the better, the newer the computer, the better, and then just have um, broadband. You know, when you trade as a general rule, the shorter the time frame, the more you should be hard hardwired into the internet and not um, not basically wireless. Wireless is fine for position trading. All right, is there a Mac OS suite? What people do, George, uh, if they wanna use our software on the Mac is they run parallels, or I think Mac has their own software, but we install a lot on Macs, 
Okay. It's nothing wrong with that, but you just have to run a windows virtual window. Okay. I guess is the best way to say that. All right. And parallels, there's a piece of software called parallels that a lot of people use for that. And it's good. All, All right. right. We do that a lot. Ken, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah. Really good to be here again. Well, thanks so much, Bennett. I always, uh, you always do such an outstanding job because I think the one thing I like best about your approach is it's very sensible and it's structured and it fits together like uh, parts of a machine. It's very intelligently designed. So you're a very smart guy. And uh, I'm sure, you know, for the price of one or two blown stops, this is definitely a must get. So I, I highly recommend it. And you, I think you're uh, an outstanding guy in the industry. So uh, thanks, Bennett, for being here, man. It's a, always a pleasure to have you here because you add, you know, you add value to the community. So thanks. Well, right back to you, Ken. Uh, I think highly of you, and I, I think you run a great series here. So uh, my pleasure to be here. Always will come. All right. Well, thanks so much. I'm going to take it back, and we will resume. Uh, let's see. Um, could you say stop share, and maybe <laughs> then I could yep, take it back yep. here. We'll still do. To, we'll still do. trying right, to thanks, figure everybody. out the same thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I know. Thanks everybody for attending. By the way. All right. Let me. Um. Oh. Oh. There it is. Stop share. All right, you got it back, I think, now, Ken. I'll All right, let's see. All right, well, thanks so much. My pleasure. All right, so traders, thank you for being here very much. Uh, great to have a big turnout and really smart people here today, as usual. Uh, glad these shindigs work. Let me ask a quick question. Do you guys like this half-hour format? Is it too rushed or is it just right? And normally we have five, six, seven presenters. Uh, today we just have a few of us, but I thought I'd run that by you. If, if you could, uh, please just type in the chat for me. Do you like the 30 minute format? I don't know about you guys, but I, I like it because it's, uh, it's brief. Okay, some saying 45 might be better. Just right. Yes, 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 yes. 30 minutes. Good. Yes. Thanks so many people. Yes. Fine. Yes. Thanks. Ken. This is good. Yes. Just right. All right. Well, thanks. Looks like the yeses have it. So thanks so much, everybody. It was really good hearing from the folks. Now, I don't think Larry's here, so I think we're going to wrap up let me um just if you have any questions for me let me know one thing i wanted to mention to you i've got a live room at trademastery.com forward slash live been running it for only 20 years but one thing that i think is kind of interesting other than that is i'm starting a new coaching series and more than just the coaching info blah 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 Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it looks okay. But this is what I want to bring your attention. What I just like I like uh, I do other people's stuff. Uh, 121, 124 million reasons to trust me. I did. And this is my actual 1099 from Fidelity. Was I did 124 million dollars worth of real money trades last year. And so I'm not saying that to impress you. Other, what I'm saying that for is to help you see that I have a lot of experience and I've made all kinds of stop losses and every mistake in the book probably a thousand times over but I've also made lots of winning trades as well and one of the goals to becoming successful is you know working with somebody that's got the experience under their belt so I've got if nothing else I've got tons of experience of trading and that's one thing that I like to bring to the table both in my coaching and in my live room so let me ask you guys do you think that's helpful if an educator shows it to actually trade I mean, I would think that would be somewhat useful, right? To make sure that they are actually what they say they are. So I, I think I'm the only person that has a tax return proof that I show every year that I actually do this stuff. So, yeah. Now I didn't make 124 million profit or else I wouldn't be here, but not uh, at leverage, but it's a, at least it's something to give some thought to, right? And it's just one of those credibility booster type things. Um, I don't have too much else to say, guys. I don't want to do any big pitch or anything. I do have my live room. Uh, you can get a two week trial for just 97 bucks. Auto renews at just 247. Money back guaranteed and then some. So uh, you can, if you try it for a couple of weeks and you don't like it, I'll give you 97 bucks back. I've had like four people do that in the last year and a half. So uh, got so many hundreds of members, uh, but you know, no hassle, no quibble. And even if a year later you say, wait, I'm not sure I wanted to spend that 97. Uh, hit me up and I'll be happy to refund you. So. There's that. Uh, you may have seen me in. I'm going to be speaking, by the way, at Money Show uh, Vegas in April, uh, April 26, I believe. So I don't know if you guys are going to be in April at the Paris Hotel, but I highly recommend uh, you try that if you can. It's the end of April, and I'll be there along with dozens of other speakers. So 
That'll be fun. I remember I ran into Bennett and Larry at the last one many years ago that I went to. Anyway, I do a really, I have the proprietary settings on a MACD that I use for intraday. Um, anyway, all kinds of good stuff. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing. We, it, It's your Saturday. Let's go out and have fun. Anyway, trademastery.com forward slash live from a real trader. All right. Uh, let me see any questions for me. My, my last tip is, again, just remember FAZ. It's a finance bear. And I think of all things out there, that's the most likely thing to go up because I don't have much faith in our banking system. I have even less faith in our politicians. How many of you have a lot of faith in our politicians and think they're doing a wonderful job? <laughs> just a little inside joke. I'd say no, none. Okay. Seriously, tell me, what do you guys think? Clowns, okay. <laughs> I'm with you, Matt. Bring in the clowns. Da, da, da. Hell no from Robert. <laughs> Sucky, how do you short Biden? Okay. <laughs> S S B I D right. Twenty five years, the capital is getting worse and worse. No, okay. Get rid of these bums. Okay, okay. So you guys share my lack of enthusiasm with the. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they do. We only have to trade them, right? So I agree, clowns. Okay. So getting a lot of comments from you folks who share my dislike and uh, lack of confidence in our powers that be. So what do you do? You short the system, all right? You short the system. So you buy stuff that goes up when the system goes down. I'm a stone cold expert in trading inverse ETFs. I've traded millions and millions and millions and millions. Heck, I did almost 11 million worth of UVXY last year alone. Boom, I know how to trade. So uh, I'm like the go-to guy for inverses. So I'm, I'm the bear in the house. So if you guys wanna learn how to trade these, again, I advocate more swing trading these than day trading because there's so much upside now right now in history is a really 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 smart time to short the market with things like SOXS I know it doesn't look great yet but that's how to short semis I'm sure it'll go up sooner rather than later our SQs uh, TW uh, the, the Russell but the best leverage ones are going to be your VIX and and our other ones so anyway the point is Let's say I put in all these tickers from everybody, and now it's all full of stuff that's normally not there. Let's see. Shh, shh. FAZ, that's that's your chart. If I had to pick two favorites, it would be FAZ and either UVXY or UVX, but uh, I think FAZ is to short banking and finance is a smart idea to go long volatility with your UVXY. Now it's starting to spike, right? It's starting to finally wake the heck up after a 52 week low to four and a half so uvxy is likely to be good and things like your short cues the good the neat thing about shorting the nasdaq is that it's down at near low right here a near-term low so uh, it's available for inexpensive if it gets back over 34 35 so that's one but i always like to i favor buying strength i don't like to i've learned the hard way guessing at a bottom isn't good like you know, I bought Borders at like $2 a share. I thought Borders Bookstore is a bargain at $2. It was even more of a bargain when it went out of business and went to zero. So Q, no shareholder value. That kind of sucks. So um, just because it looks cheap doesn't, just like Larry said, just because it, it looks oversold does not mean a buy. And that's exactly right. So anyway, I like to buy strength. Red candle here, so I'm not going to go long yet. But I think anywhere north of uh, the higher, over the 26, 50, 27, just remember I said this in a month when this thing's up at 48 and you'll say, oh, yeah, he was right. Remember, it? and he told us it was 40. Anyway, this is just getting started for proof. You have just to look back at the COVID lows, right? To look at the three year. Um, CFAZ, RSQs. These things have lots of volatility and lots of price action worth trading so hmm. things i like like volatility you know uvxy split adjusted just a couple years back I'm trying to put this to the three year that is the real perspective back at the covid lows you think you might be able to make some money if you bought a five and sold the 500. not saying we're going to get there for sure but here's another to put in perspective this is the chart i wanted to show you faz doesn't look too excited just yet, but look at this three year high volume. Brilliant people in Wall Street were buying the heck out of this just a few days ago. And that's why we have three year high green volume in FAZ. Please remember, I said this when it's up at 80 or uh, 115. Remember, I was there telling you guys long down at 24. Anyway, 
COVID lows, uh, it was way up at 300, right? So lots of upside volatility in these charts. And I think we may well do the right thing as we move forward. So anyway, I'm going to take off. You guys take care. Thanks for being here. We have another action-packed event coming up a month from now, the last Saturday of each month this year. And uh, trade smart, guys, and I'll see you next time. And I appreciate y'all for being here because I know there's other things you could be doing with your Saturday, but I always get a lot out of these fellows. I learned from uh, like uh, Bennett and Larry and all the others. So take care. See you guys next time. And bye for now. Hasta la vista. Trade smart and make it work. Bye for now.